Hey everyone, thanks for your time. This week I got to interview NASA's manager for the SLS Stages office, and I'll be going over that over the next few weeks. In this video, I'll provide some initial takeaways from that. The Space Agency also posted some imagery of the next core stage build that itself provided a little news. There was also a small update on gateway assembly and test, and a pictorial update on a Mobile Launcher 2 construction milestone. But there's an election coming up here in the U.S., and given that NASA is a federal government agency, one gets the feeling that any major decisions, like the ones for the Orion heat shield, are on hold until after that. And there are other big announcements and updates that could be provided. I'll recap some of the big picture updates that we've waited for for seemingly all year now, but it's likely that we're going to have to wait a little longer until after the election. During the week, we got a visual update on the status of one of the critical path items for the Artemis 3 SLS vehicle, which is the liquid oxygen tank. Two weeks ago, the Core Stage 3 liquid oxygen tank was installed in cell E at NASA's Michoud Assembly Facility in New Orleans East. That's in the main complex of buildings that SLS Stages prime contractor Boeing uses for production of core stages and exploration upper stages. Cell E is in MAF's VAB, the Vertical Assembly Building. That is the internal clean cell, where the inside of the propellant tanks are given a thorough washdown to sanitize them. It is one of the last preparatory steps before the tank is moved next door to Building 131, where it will be coated with corrosion protective primer, and then eventually its spray-on foam insulation. The imagery that was taken on October 11th wasn't published until this past Tuesday, October 22nd, when NASA released still images and B-roll video of the tank in Building 110, the VAB, while it was being rotated or broken over from horizontal to vertical by the two heavy cranes in the building. And then it was lifted into cell E for the internal clean. It's also useful to observe what else is going on in Building 110, what is present or not present at a given time. We can see that as of October 11th, when these stills were taken, the Exploration Upper Stage Weld Confidence article was no longer present in the Vertical Assembly Center, or VAC, tool, which doesn't confirm that those confidence welds are complete, but is a strong indication of that. That has implications for the Artemis 4 hardware because there's a lot of core stage and EUS traffic that needs to go through that tool. Coincident with the newer imagery, stills and video shot back in June when the LOX tank was moved out of cell F was also published. Cell F is the hydrostatic proof testing cell, which is how that is done for these 8.4 meter wide liquid oxygen tanks, going back to the one for the space shuttle external tank. This imagery shot back during the lift and breakover operations in June shows a similar operation except in reverse. The tank is lifted out of cell F, the lift fixture is attached and then a second crane is attached to that, and then the tank is broken over from vertical to horizontal and placed on a transportation tool. The tank was then moved to area 6 in building 103 which building 110 adjoins. That's where we got a peek of it in mid-July on a tram tour coincident with the rollout ceremonies for Core Stage 2. Looking around in the June imagery provides some additional context to what I saw a month later in July. In July, we could see that the EUS LH2 tank weld confidence dome was in the VAC, but was raised out of position for welding. What the June imagery shows is a barrel weld confidence article that is being staged to be loaded in the tool. It appears that article was positioned in the tool when I saw the VAC in mid-July, but the article itself was out of view. At any rate, the takeaways from this release of imagery is that the Core Stage 3 liquid oxygen tank is making progress towards readiness for the forward join with the other two elements, the inner tank and the forward skirt. There will be more to say about that in the near future. On Thursday, October 24th, I interviewed NASA SLS Stages Manager Steve Wofford to get a status update on core stage production. I'll go into that in more depth in upcoming weekly roundups. For now, here's a list of a few early observations. The first is that NASA and Boeing are still pushing on the core stage production pace. 
They have challenges to overcome, but they are still forecasting that they can finish core stage three and hand it over to exploration ground systems by the end of 2025. They also want to finish core stage four within a year after that, so by the end of 2026. Next is that there is an issue with some of the tooling used in the application of spray-on foam insulation in cell N. That's where the acreage and the domes of the large propellant tanks are robotically sprayed. The core stage three liquid hydrogen tank is currently in the cell and they are working to get that tooling repaired. That is now the current critical path for the build. Mr. Wofford confirmed that the EUS Weld Confidence article is now clear of the VAC and the welding tool is being prepared to weld Artemis IV core stage and EUS structures. If we take a look at the last core stage 4 status that I had, the two propellant tanks were waiting for VAC welds and although it sounds like the schedule is still in work, they are planning to weld the LH2 tank and then the LOX tank after that. I am trying to get the disposition of the forward skirt but I'm not sure if it got its two L-ring welds or not. Obviously, that traffic needs to be choreographed with the articles for EUS. The qualification articles that will be assembled into a structural test article, and then the flight articles for the first flight stage unit. Mr. Wofford also noted that the Kennedy Space Center VAB, High Bay 2 tooling that will be used for final assembly of core stage units, beginning with core stage 3, is nearing completion. Futuramic built that under contract with Boeing, and he said that tooling could be ready for production work next month in November. He said they were looking at a production readiness review for the tooling as early as next week. Core Stage 2 is lying in the VAB transfer aisle, mostly in storage at this point, and NASA and Boeing are looking at a possible opportunity to use the new production and processing cell if it doesn't interfere with the Artemis II stacking schedule. Some work on the stage cannot be performed while it is horizontal, so it would need to wait until the stage is vertical again. If Artemis II stacking was already underway, that would be after the core stage is mated to the stacked Artemis II solid rocket boosters. But now with the schedule uncertainty for Artemis II, it might also be possible to do that like get-ahead work in the new High Bay 2 platforms and tooling. That opportunity could hinge on the long-awaited Orion heat shield decisions from NASA. If VAB High Bay 2 is ready next month and mating the stage to the boosters gets delayed possibly into next year, then we might see core stage 2 in VAB High Bay 2. More to come on this interview in upcoming videos. Also on Thursday, October 24th, Kennedy Space Center Public Affairs published some imagery of the progress towards the next Mobile Launcher 2 construction milestone, assembly of the chair structure. The social media post noted that those elements were lifted up onto the ML2 base structure beginning last Sunday, October 20th. The next day, Friday, October 25th, PAO reported that primary structural assembly of the chair was complete, providing additional shots of that work in another social media post. Prime contractor Bechtel also posted a time-lapse video on social media that day, showing part of the process of lifting the structural elements into position and securing them together. After this structure is built out, then the first tower modules will be stacked on top to begin the build-out of the umbilical tower. That operation to stack modules 4 through 7, also called rig and set, was planned to begin in the winter, so sometime around the end of this year, beginning of next. These graphics are slides from a Bechtel presentation made at a construction industry conference in February. They provide useful details and they also help visualize the elements of the mobile launcher and the sequence of construction. The Gateway program provided a little bit of an update during the week. Back at the beginning of October, NASA published a couple of pictures taken of the Halo module structure in Italy in July. Talus Alenia Space, which took those pictures, assembled the structure there 
and is now verifying its structural integrity before it is shipped to the U.S. for outfitting of pretty much all its working equipment. But publication of those pictures in early October didn't provide any status of testing. So I asked at the time to get an update on that and also to find out if the Gateway partners had come up with a new target launch date for the initial elements, which are the power and propulsion element and the HALO, which stands for Habitation and Logistics Outpost. Those two modules will be fully connected and integrated in Florida pre-flight, and then another expendable Falcon Heavy booster will get them up to a sub-GTO Earth orbit. Static load testing of the HALO structure is complete, but now it is going through proof pressure testing. I asked about the status of that and when the structure was now expected to ship to prime contractor Northrop Grumman's Gilbert, Arizona facility in the Phoenix metro area. According to NASA Public Affairs at Johnson Space Center in Houston, proof pressure testing is expected to be completed this month and transportation of the HALO structure to Gilbert is now planned early next year, 2025. From a bigger picture standpoint, though, we're now almost 10 full months since NASA announced they were reevaluating the target launch date for PPE and HALO, and the response for that was, quote, the agency is in the process of evaluating launch dates to support this objective and will share an update once this process is complete, unquote. So as of right now, end of October 2024, the only recent forecast in public is the joint confidence level forecast from a year ago at the end of 2023, which projects a 70% chance that PPE and HALO will be ready to launch by December 2027. In other news and notes for the week, we saw the Artemis II flight crew training with the Orion side hatch earlier in the year and visiting the booster fabrication facility earlier this week. Orion Prime contractor Lockheed Martin published imagery of a crew training visit in August to the Lockheed Martin Space Campus in Littleton, Colorado, which is in the Denver metro area. NASA also published an image feature which notes that the side hatch will typically be operated by Exploration Ground Systems team members. The closeout crew will handle that pre-launch, and then EGS is also responsible for landing and recovery, so they would normally open the side hatch after splashdown. Orion also has a docking hatch that flight crews will use for in-space movement from Orion to docked spacecraft and back. There's a quick shot in the video showing the double hatch launch configuration for Orion. The crew module is encapsulated by the ogive fairings that are a part of the Orion launch abort system. In an emergency, both of those hatches need to be opened quickly, and the crew needs to be able to do that from inside the crew module. And we can see a very quick cut of that in the video. As a separate reference notes, when open from the inside, the crew module hatch will activate the LAS hatch release on contact. NASA's feature also notes that in an emergency, pyrotechnic devices could be used to open the side hatch instantaneously, rather than the gearbox system that I'm assuming we see in these video cuts. But there are different emergencies, and the pyros might not apply to every case. Kennedy Space Center Public Affairs published a group image of crew members Jeremy Hansen and Victor Glover with prime contractor Northrop Grumman's team in the booster fabrication facility, along with the two solid rocket booster forward assemblies for their SLS vehicle. The flight hardware in the picture, from left to right, is an unidentified Artemis IV aft skirt. It could be the left or right then the right-hand Artemis II forward assembly, the left-hand Artemis II forward assembly, and an unidentified Artemis III aft skirt. This provides a good visual snapshot of the status of this booster assembly hardware. The two Artemis II forward assemblies are basically sitting in storage in the BFF until they are needed for stacking. The timing of that is, of course, still to be determined and still to be announced. Taking a look at the big picture again, there are some big decisions, announcements, and or updates that we've been waiting for. The Orion Base Heat Shield decision and announcement of that decision was anticipated going back to the end of July when some NASA officials hinted that work was wrapping up. But that doesn't appear to be the case since officially the space agency is currently saying the investigation process is still underway. Both of those can be true at the same time. 
It may be that the investigation work and the independent review were completed and briefed internally, and now NASA is internally deliberating what to decide. Regardless, the Artemis II situation and schedule are uncertain, and that uncertainty is growing as the months pass by. The fifth Starship flight test was successfully completed almost two weeks ago now, so there's now more anticipation about when that development roadmap will be refreshed. The current one goes back to the beginning of the year and is out of date. As noted earlier, NASA still isn't ready to say anything about a new target launch date for the initial gateway elements. When the December 2027 launch readiness date projection was first disclosed back in March, NASA officially noted that was a risk-assessed date and that they were working to a more aggressive schedule. Even before that, in January, NASA said they were re-evaluating the work to target launch date but it is now almost a year later and they still are not ready to say anything in public. There's also an announcement of the flight crew for Artemis 3. NASA recently responded to my question about that timing, saying they would announce an Artemis 3 crew sometime between 2 years to 18 months before the launch date. We're already less than 2 years away from that date now. In theory, NASA could announce that any time. But we're also less than two weeks away from a high-stakes general election here in the United States, so it's unlikely that we'll hear anything about these big decisions until after Election Day and voting is closed. We've seen comments from NASA Administrator Bill Nelson in the past week or so that the space agency was on schedule for Artemis II, for Starship HLS, and for Artemis III but one should take that with a grain of proverbial salt at this point in the election cycle. I went over a government accounting office audit report about EGS last week, which suggested that Artemis II wasn't completely on schedule and provided details and rationale for that assessment. If Artemis III is on schedule for less than two years from now, given all the outstanding questions and watch items, we would need to see a detailed assessment of Axiom, Orion, SLS, and Starship HLS to make that conclusion. Instead, it's more likely that politics is imposing a pre-election blackout period that will keep existing positions and pronouncements frozen in place until after the election. Thanks for watching. Click on the like button if you found this video informative.